Thank you all for joining us this evening. We are really glad to have you here for this conversation. My name is Autumn McDonald and I'm the director of New America California. We are a civic enterprise uh, based in California and we are part of the larger New America, which is a think and action tank based in Washington, DC. We uh, focus on issues of economic equity and host forums like this one, uh, in addition to other uh, ways in which we engage the community. We are thrilled to have with us this evening, Kathy Black from La Casa, uh, Julia Arroyo from Young Women's Freedom Center, Sonia Passi from Free From, and my co-moderator, Debbie Meslow with the Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, we are really thrilled to engage in this conversation, but I wanted to start us off first by passing uh, the torch over to uh, Debbie to talk a little bit more about uh, the Department on the Status of Women. We are thrilled to partner with. Thank you, Autumn. Uh, it's wonderful to work well, with you to put the, this very important event on. I want to thank all the panelists. I know we'll have a chance to talk with you in a moment. And I know that we're hoping that this is a very conversational panel and that we want to engage um, also with people who are watching through our chat function, we want to incorporate your questions for the panelists. And I know I've been looking forward to having this conversation because um, it's a real concern in the middle of a scary time. Um, the rise that we see in domestic violence and that so many women uh, and others in our community and cisgenders and others are not safe within their homes and their homes are not a safe space to shelter. And so really bringing panelists together tonight to talk about that. So I wanna thank everyone for their time. Um, as Autumn mentioned, I'm a commissioner on the Commission on the Status of Women. Um, we are a mayoral appointee body here in the city of San Francisco. Um, the citizens of San Francisco helped to create us uh, by charter initiative, um, and we are the strongest commission in the country. We have a department on status of women. San Francisco is the only um, uh, city to have a department uh, with a commission, and we give out 90% of our budget to community-based uh, partners that help to prevent the violence against women. So um, glad to be here with you tonight. I did want to highlight a couple of things. Um, even though the department, our, our staff continues to work remote, uh, and honor the shelter place. We do have a resource page uh, at our website, um, and that is for survivors of violence, uh, families and community members, and that is at um, sfgov.org slash DOSW. And uh, we continue to have staff at our City Emergency Operations Center uh, and continue to support our emergency response efforts. And finally, we've been working in partnership with the DA's office uh, on a safe home program, which is a public-private partnership to link domestic violence survivors with free and temporary furnished apartments in San Francisco. So looking to see how we can be helpful in this time and looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you, back to you, Autumn. Thanks so much, Debbie. So I'd love for us to get started. Although we are lots of boxes here, Brady Bunch style, if you will, uh, I would like to make it as conversational and uh, to imagine that all of us are maybe just grabbing some coffee together, including every single person who is uh, tuned in as well. Uh, so with that, I would love if you, uh, each of you would start by just telling us the two minutes story of you. Tell us a little bit about who you are uh, and how you ended up doing the type of work that you are doing now. And I'd love to start with Kathy, if that's okay. Hi. Um, thank you for having me um, this evening. It's really awesome to be part of this panel. So I, um, my name is Kathy Black and I've worked at La Casa for 23 years. And I, that's almost as shocking to me when I say it as it is. Um, it's a long time. And I, I started out in a, as the director of development. And after being here for about four years, um, the board hired me as the executive director. And it's really been an honor to um, serve in that capacity. And I, I feel like it's a real privilege. I, I was born in the Midwest, um, just outside of Chicago, um, but I've lived in California's, well, really um, the North Bay, my, um, almost my entire uh, life. And so I feel very connected to, I worked all my professional life in San Francisco um, so I feel really connected to the area and to the community that really is involved in these important conversations and issues. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you for sharing a little bit about your story. Uh, Julia, will you tell us a little bit about you, please?
Sorry, Julia, you're still on mute. Okay, I will start from the beginning. So hi, um, my name is Julia Arroyo, um, or I go by Julia as well, and use she, her pronouns. And um, uh, the question was, how did I come to this work? Or just to tell myself a little bit about myself. Um, so I would just say that I'm from San Francisco. I was born here, I was born at Letterman's Army Hospital. Um, and um, I would say that in about the year 2000, um, I actually experienced going into the juvenile justice system. And uh, I think that I had the right type of mentors or women come into my life um, after that experience, um, such as like Latifa Simon, Julie Posadas, uh, Cheyenne Bell at the time. There was Norma Hotelling who was running the SAGE project. And um, I remember when I was getting out of, um, oh, I'm sorry, one second. Um, I remember I went, um, when I was getting out of juvenile hall and I was getting my, my foster care uh, money and I was saying that I'm gonna go to beauty school. And I remember them going, oh, that's, that's, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, and also you have a calling and so, um, somehow I got wrapped up into this this type of work and they invited me to come back and uh, work inside of the, the jail um, and also to do some other transformative work with um, girls that had experienced um, the underground street economy and street-based violence and gender-based violence. So um, that was back in 2000 and now, um, uh, yeah, so... Now I'm working at the Young Women's Freedom Center and I'm the site director here in our San Francisco organization. Fantastic, thanks so much for sharing with us. And Sonia, now I will uh, turn it over to you. We'd love to hear a little bit about your story, uh, who you are and how you got engaged in this work. Sure, hi everyone, I'm Sonia Passi. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Free From. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I have been doing domestic violence activism since I was 16. Um, I grew up in and around abuse. I didn't necessarily have words for what I was seeing and experiencing and witnessing. Um, but when I was 16, I thought I wanted to be a human rights lawyer. Um, I started an Amnesty International group at my high school that year, and their campaign um, that year was Global Violence Against Women. And I remember getting all of the information and reading about it and, you know, learning for the first time that one in three women globally will experience uh, intimate partner violence in their lifetime. And I just remember, one, being horrified that I was learning this for the first time, um, not understanding why this wasn't the front page of every newspaper every single day. It was clear to me that when you're talking about one in three, you're talking about a global crisis. So why are we not talking about the crisis and addressing the crisis? Um, and also, I very quickly resonated with this idea that to be safe in your own home is a fundamental human right. And if we aren't safe in our own home, where, where can we ever truly feel safe? And so the first thing that I started by doing was uh, domestic violence awareness weeks at my high school. I then went on to college. I grew up in England and I went to college in England. I, during college, I created a group that was educating campus and high school students about intimate partner violence. I then moved to the Bay. I actually went to Berkeley Law, um, which was when I first met Kathy. And I started uh, the Family Violence Appellate Project while I was in law school, which is a Oakland-based nonprofit uh, providing pro bono appellate legal services to survivors and really trying to shape California domestic violence law to benefit survivors through the courts. Um, and what I kept seeing happen over and over again was that the clients that were coming to us, um, very often they had left three or four years ago um, they were still homeless, they were living in their car, or they were living on someone's couch, 
and they had lost custody of their children to the person who had harmed them and more often than not had harmed the children um, because they couldn't afford to support them and um, because of the financial devastation that had accompanied that uh, domestic abuse. And this kept happening over and over again. And I started to look at kind of what was out there to support survivors in that long-term rebuilding financially. Um, and I found that there was a gap and the gap really, I think exists because we're trying to solve a global crisis as a very small group of underfunded and under-resourced uh, organizations. Um, and that's when uh, late 2016, I started Free From with the mission to uh, support survivors and build infrastructure for survivors to be able to uh, ensure their financial security and long-term safety. Thank you so much for sharing um, each of you how you came to this work. I know we really want tonight to be about practical solutions as well um, for people who are watching, uh, people who might have people in their community who need help if they need help themselves. Um, so we'd love to just hear a little bit more about the organizations um, that each of you run and exactly um, what it is that you do for survivors and how survivors can connect with you um, for the services that you provide. So Kathy, could we start with you? Tell us a little bit about La Casa. Sure. Um, so uh, La Casa started in 1976 at, right here in San Francisco. And I'm told by the founders that it was the third domestic violence uh, shelter pro program founded worldwide. And um, so I, I, they, they, their goal was to specifically work with victims and survivors of domestic violence. And, and um, so it's you know, been at the vanguard of the domestic violence movement from the very beginning. So we are San Francisco's oldest and largest shelter and um, for victims and survivors of domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Our mission is to respond to calls for help from victims and survivors of all ages, uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We want to give survivors tools to transform their lives. That means partnering with programs like uh, Sonia's um, and, and to um, educate the community um, to prevent future violence, um, to change public perceptions about domestic violence. So those are some key factors. And I think that what most people think of when they um, hear about La Casa de las Madres is our shelter program. And, we're, and, and that is, that was the foundational part of what, how, how this organization was formed and um, the, you know, sheroes that brought it all together at that time. Over the years, things have really changed because um, the needs of, of victims and survivors have, have changed dramatically um, since 1976. And so we really had to find a way to be out in the community where, where individuals are. So if someone is at Zuckerberg General Hospital and they're at one of the five primary care clinics, they are very, and they're, and they're um, disclosing that they're having you know, they're struggling with violence in their relationship at home. They may not be safe at home. Um, they will um, get a warm handoff to a La Casa advocate who's sitting on the campus over at Zuckerberg General Hospital. Um, of course, we still have our shelter. It's the, you know, the biggest ticket item we have. It's the most expensive, but also the Band-Aid, right? It's not, not getting at the source, but hugely important. We... Um, we are also, we work with the San Francisco Housing Authority and we have two advocates that um, serve about 4,000 units of public housing. So if there are victims and survivors who are either in, currently in an abusive relationship or are struggling to get on their feet and be in a safe place, they can again work with the advocates and do uh, transfers to a new unit where it's safe, have lock changes, um, a whole host of things. The, the housing authority might do something like um, somebody is in um, a, um, a violent relationship and they ask for a transfer and the housing authority um, 
doesn't really see the big picture and they may move them to the unit right next door. So that's, you know, we're able to help, um, help survivors navigate that system. We also are part of the highly, highly I'm sorry, the high lethality assessment team at the Bayview um, Police Department, and that's a project that comes out of the department and the Department and the Commission on the Status of Women. And what we do there is also receive warm handoffs. So when responding officers work with a victim and they're asked a set of questions, if they um, uh, score a certain point, the officers are able to talk to the victim about um, their risks and ask them if they can call La Casa and if the victim is willing to speak to uh, an advocate. And that often will end up with the, um, with law enforcement helping the uh, victim or survivor come and even just spend the night at La Casa's shelter, have a warm place to sit, figure out what they want to do and explore their options. So it's not, it's a, it's a gentle intervention. Uh, out of a not so gentle um, event. We uh, have an advocate that's outstationed at the San Francisco Police Department and the Special Victims Unit. And so all of the reports that stem from intimate partner violence, um, domestic violence, uh, sexual assault, stalking, those reports go to an advocate and that advocate calls each victim, makes several attempts in hopes of connecting, and then um, provides, finds out if the, if the individual is interested in receiving some assistance, because we are, you know, we want to empower um, victims and survivors. So they will um, connect them with community resources. Our advocate will connect them with not just La Casa, but other really important community resources, legal service programs, financial empowerment programs, um, uh, any any number uh, any number of of projects, and um, we also are very connected to the San Francisco Unified School District. So, in a although this year was surely going to be very different, um, we have um, advocates that are connected to the wellness centers, and so teachers and school administrators are able to refer students to La Casa's advocate. And the goal is to um, keep students engaged in school, right? So they may be experiencing domestic violence in their home, their parents may be involved in domestic violence, or they may be, in, or, or they may be just um, engaging in new relationships that, are, that they don't feel are healthy. And so we try and be very open and um, work, work with them toward that. And then last but not least, a big program that we're involved in is the CalWORKS program and the DV waiver, making sure that the, the clock stops for victims who are, on, uh, who are receiving CalWORKS benefits and that they're able to get back on their feet and that, that they, they, uh, it extends the time that they receive their benefits. And that's really important. And um, so those are, those are, you know, a, a general at our drop-in counseling center. We, the world has changed completely, <laughs> but we are working on um, connecting people with um, counselors by phone. We're going to um, do small uh, group sessions starting um, um, in the summer and probably look for platforms where those, those kind of services can be offered in a way that is safe. Um, people are knocking on the door. It says close because um, we can't social, you know, um, really be socially distant here. Um, but but um, victims and survivors are coming by almost every day and asking for help. So it's it's been an interesting process. And we're still answering our hotline, our text line. So we've got a lot going on. Yes. Thank you, Kathy. I know how much La Casa has evolved under your leadership and in particular going out to where survivors need you the most throughout the community and really talking in those moments when survivors have an opportunity to connect with resources. Um, that's really evolved under your leadership. And I know we'll get to um, uh, later in the program, COVID specifically and what people are experiencing and these, these tragic rises that we're seeing throughout the globe. And to your point, even with um, 
being able to, to be there for people who really need that right now, talking about um, specifically how we're doing that. So thank you. Um, and Julia, would love to go uh, to you next. Um, Young Women's Freedom Center, an iconic social justice institution. Uh, you mentioned, you know, Shiro of the community, Latifa Simon, all the women um, who work there and who've been part of uh, that movement. So we'd love to hear just a little bit more um, about the Young Women's Freedom Center. Right. Um, I'll do it like a little genealogy too of the um, 1993 and I'll tell it in my interpretation in the way that storytellers have told me. In 1993, uh, Rachel Pfeffer had came and she was doing her dissertation on um, uh, women and girls living and surviving on the streets of San Francisco. Um, this was at the kind of the tail end or height of the AIDS, AIDS, crack generation, kind of all of those things, epidemics were happening at the time. And what they, and what Rachel did was she um, trained everyone as these kind of health workers. And so they, she hired those that were directly impacted to kind of lead uh, the work. And what she found out out of um, her findings is that these people were actually brilliant and they were like living and surviving and taking care of themselves all on their own and finding what they needed. And so she left the organization um, to those young women. And so Latifa Simon became um, the youngest executive director in the, the nation at that point um, and took on and Jessica Nowlin, who's now the uh, executive director, she was, I think, the deputy director at 17 years old. And so there was like all of these great phenomenal uh, leaders. And when I, when I really think about the work, I, I really think about this like leadership incubator of just like really investing in that leadership of those like directly impacted and dispersing among, amongst everywhere and just leading really radically in their own ways, in many different ways, um, for all of the folks that came through the organization. So our mission is um, to uh, empower and inspire, you know, cis, transgender, non-conforming young folks that have been involved in the, involved or impacted by the underground street economy or the criminal justice system and to make transformative changes in their own lives and their community. So um, that's, that's the Young Women's Freedom Center. And oh, and I actually came through, you know, I heard uh, Latifa Simon when I was uh, coming out of juvenile hall, she was giving one of these real fiery speeches and I was <laughs> like, oh, how she know my story? How she, how, she know what, how she know what I'm going through, you know, and so, um, I was actually able to experience what it was like to to move through the organization too as a participant and as a staff member as well. We are huge fans of the center. Thank you for all the work that you do. And I do think from its early days, the center has really centered voices. And to your point, brilliant and amazing minds who should be centered in the policy making um, and other things uh, all around this movement. So thank you everything that Thank you for everything you're doing. And Sonia, uh, Freeform, um, and just the work that you've done, fascinating, coming at it from a crucial side, the legal side, uh, and supporting women, it sounds like, in the economic uh, recovery and economic social justice work. Tell us a little bit more about these organizations that, that you founded um, and what you're doing now. It sounds like you're working in partnership with La Casa as well. Sure, it's free from, not free form. It's like Sorry. free from abuse. Yes. No, no, everybody does it. Totally, everybody does it. We we launched and then ABC family changed their name to free form and then it was game over. I know, I kept on um, looking at it and didn't want to mess that no, up. No, so no, my no, apologies. not at all, not at all. Yeah, yes, as soon from. as I say free from abuse, people get it. Yes. Um, so we do a lot of things um, and I'll kind of talk about some of the most exciting projects that we're working on right now, but everything is around building an ecosystem of support for survivors to ensure their long-term safety. And we sort of operate from the standpoint that um, financial security is necessary for survivors to stay safe in the long run. 
and um, investing in survivors is the way to end generational gender-based violence. Um, the number one reason survivors stay in and return to abusive situations is financial insecurity. Um, and that's for two reasons. The first is it's just incredibly expensive to have experienced gender-based violence. Uh, the CDC did a study in 2018 and they found that intimate partner violence costs a female survivor an average of $104,000, which is more than most people make in a year, in two years. Um, and then you add to that the fact that in 99% of cases, uh, financial abuse occurs. And that looks like anything from not being allowed to work to having to hand over your paycheck to not knowing what bank accounts are in your name, what credit cards are in your name, having debt that's either coerced or fraudulent. And so often survivors are faced with this insurmountable, impossible decision of do I leave with six figures in debt, no job, no cash, no fallback system, and a damaged credit score? And how do I stay safe with that mountain to overcome? Um, and so a couple of the things that we're doing, uh, the first is we've developed a national training program for domestic violence organizations through which we train um, uh, domestic violence case managers, advocates, all the way up to executive directors sometimes on how to build programming to support survivors' financial security. How do you support someone in building credit? How do you support someone who may have never worked before in building income? How do you have conversations with people who've been uh, financially abused about money and have that be a productive and healing conversation? And so we've been training uh, nationwide um, and really kind of seeing that ripple effect starting to happen. Uh, the first organization that we ever trained is based in Houston. Um, the executive director went through the training and within three weeks of the training, she increased everyone's salaries because she understood that her staff's financial well-being was key to her clients' well-being. Uh, and they now have 16 clients who they've supported in starting small businesses because we trained them in doing that. Um, we're also kind of focused on how do you get um, resources directly to survivors and we've got two ways in which we're doing that right now. We've created an online tech platform for survivors called the Compensation Compass um, that supports survivors very quickly in figuring out how they um, can pursue compensation for the harm they have experienced, either from the person that harmed them or from the state. For example, very few people know that in California, if you have eligible receipts and you are a victim of crime, you can get up to $77,000 from the state of California. Um, and so, and you have to, you basically have to fill out a form and attach your receipts. Like it's, it's, that, sim it's that simple. Um, and so this tool that we've created, it's available in every state. The laws are different in every state. So you start by putting in your state and it will give you a step-by-step -step guide as to how to do that. Step one, here's the form. Step two, this is how to fill it out. Step three, this is how long you have to file. Another kind of direct to survivors resources that we've created this year, we didn't intend to create it during COVID, but that's where we ended up, is we've created peer-to-peer -peer financial support groups for survivors. So if you think about these are both terrible examples, but it's kind of what we base the model on. If you think about Weight Watchers, or you think about AA or Al-Anon. These are community-based groups started by the community for the community, a very formulaic model, if you will, and very simple so that anyone can start one in their community. One of the things that um, is, is missing in the way that we're approaching domestic violence is we're not thinking about survivors who don't leave. We're not thinking about survivors who either can't leave or don't want to leave or don't have the money to leave. Um, survivors who are living in communities where you don't go outside of the community, survivors who are in rural areas where there aren't services. And so how can we create something that communities can support themselves with, regardless of philanthropy, regardless of state funding for the issue, regardless of whether there are services nearby? Um, and also, how can we 
both support survivors in building financial security and break down the isolation of abuse and sort of it's it's accomplishing both of those and so we've now got groups um, that have either formed or are forming in about 23 states and that's really starting to take off and then kind of the rest of our attention goes to doing systems change work so how do we bring other pillars of our community and our society into addressing the issue our employers our banks our credit card companies um, and one big project that we're working on this year um, is we have almost finished developing industry guidelines and best practices for banks on how they can do their part to address uh, economic abuse, but also support clients, customers who are survivors. So everything from uh, creating protected bank accounts for survivors to be able to safely store, save money, to training bank tellers on how to spot economic abuse when it's happening in front of you and how to respond to having systems and processes in place to um, interrupt things like invasions of privacy or you know, keep a survivor's uh, new address confidential from a joint account holder. Um, and really, you know, the movement is doing so much to end domestic violence, but we're talking about a systemic problem. So we're always asking ourselves the question, what, how do we make sure that everyone's doing the bit that they can do? Because that's how you solve. A problem of this magnitude. I really appreciate all of you sharing your personal stories, the work that you're doing. Uh, I find it really compelling. And Sonia, you know that I am familiar with your work and you as uh, one of our New America California Fellows in 2018. Uh, and I have heard you tell many stories that I think really hit home for those who are not as familiar with the true picture, the true experience. Uh, I can say for myself that my daughter's middle name is after my best friend who unfortunately is a victim of domestic violence, um, was not a survivor, but even with that, I, I, I couldn't say that I know the, like, the true experience or what, what that looks like, the picture. Uh, I know of one, one snippet, uh, but I think it can be really compelling for folks to hear a little bit more about what that looks like. And you've done that in some ways by sharing some of the elements that many may not think about, the financial aspects of it. What does it look like to have a joint account with someone? What does it look like to have um, your credit ruined, to have money stolen, your, your paycheck stolen from you? Uh, things like that that keep you from having the ability to get free from. Um, so with that in mind, I would love if you would start us off, we'll go in the other direction this time, um, by just painting a little bit of a picture for us and whatever you think um, is fitting to tell us a little bit about what it might be slightly like to walk in in the shoes of a survivor. Sure, sure. I also would love to say, well, I wouldn't love to say this, but this is the facts. There was a study that came out recently that found that 46% uh, of commun of women in community colleges have experienced financial abuse. Um, which is higher than the number of people who've experienced domestic violence. And what I think that suggests is that more people have experienced financial abuse than we think. Um, and, you know, we don't talk about money as a society. So it's so kind of under the radar when it happens. But I'll give you a couple of examples of situations of financial abuse that we've kind of worked with survivors to get through. Um, so just to kind of paint a picture of what that looks like, the first is a client who uh, left her harm doer um, and sort of like 18 months later going through the divorce uh, and she started to get debt collectors calling her and she didn't understand why. Um, and she found out that she had seven credit cards in her name. And uh, the total amount of money on those credit cards was $17,000. And none of it was hers. She didn't even know about it. And she did some investigating. She found that her uh, ex-husband had taken out the credit cards. He had had them sent to his brother's house. So she had never seen them or the statements. And together they had uh, amassed $17,000 of debt in her name, which remained unpaid to the day the debt collector started calling. It had completely destroyed her credit score. Uh, she was living off of, she was living on someone's couch with two kids and I think she got $535 a month. 
Um, so there was no way she was ever going to be able to pay it off. We were able to work with her to get six of those seven credit card companies to, for, to recognize that debt as fraud. And, you know, from our perspective, we weren't saying forgive this debt. We were saying go after the person whose debt it is. Um, but one of the credit card companies refused, and that was $7,000 in debt. So she's yet to be able to recover from that. Um, and we were even able to demonstrate that she had a restraining order. We were able to demonstrate that uh, she wasn't in the country when most of these, like she had flight receipts and the payments were local, so she couldn't have possibly been the one to make those charges. Um, but the credit card company called the police and the police said, this is a civil matter, we can't help. And so that was all they needed to know to not get involved. Uh, another survivor, she was financially controlled to such a degree that she went to her harm doer and said, I need money for tampons. And he said, um, by my calculation, you have five days until your next period. So I know that you're lying to me. Um, another client, and this goes back to the banking work that we talked about, uh, fled, moved to a different state, got a new apartment, went into the branch of her bank and said, uh, this is my new address. I need a new debit card. And the bank sent a letter to her old address a week later with her new address and her new debit card. Um, and so all of that time and energy and uh, bravery that had gone into getting safe, uh, she now had to start again. Wow. Thank you for sharing these stories. I think that um, it's really important for people to be able to understand this voice, this experience, uh, and so that they can Hopefully everyone who's listening is already very much compelled to figure out what they can do um, and how they can be uh, helpful in really meaningful ways. But if they weren't before, hopefully these stories are helping them see a little bit more about what's at stake. Um, I would love to move now to Julia and ask you if you are willing to share um, a story or two or whatever you feel is a compelling way of just kind of sharing the stories of things that you've you've seen so that people can understand what's at stake here. Absolutely. So um, one of the things I want to just say is like domestic violence shows up in in different ways and violence shows up in different ways and so in our response to it shows up in different ways and I you know I'm somebody who experienced violence at it at a really young age and um, really just kind of have the experience of just trying to figure it out. And um, I do have the experience of being exploited on the streets. And I know that a lot of it stemmed as a direct result of some of the things I experienced as at a really early age. And so at the time um, that I was incarcerated as a as a youth I felt punished for like the the harm that I had experienced and it and it kind of further validated my experience of feeling like unwanted or or left alone you know or left alone and and uh when I believe uh when violence happens now I see that it's it's a time where you need folks to kind of like gather and, sh and show you love and i just feel like i could have had a different response um and if i would have had more patience from the uh, adults around me to kind of understand a, a little bit more deeply about what i was going through because um if if at the first look at it you may have looked at it like oh this this person's like being very resistant and rebellious and you know um acting out and really it was more so of i i believe it was a direct response to a lot of the violence that i had experienced and i was working it out in my own way 
And so, um, and I, I kind of needed that space too, to, to kind of figure it out also. Um, so I think that there are people that are experiencing, one thing that I, I can't say that would, I experienced so many years ago and like stepping into like, I know that our, our detention center is closing now in San Francisco and we're, and we're going as a different response, but that's out of like us evolving, you know, in our, in our solutions of how we uh, respond to when things happen inside of our communities. So um, I think that it, it's, it's got a little people kind of thinking like, what's next and what are we going to do? But uh, one thing that I, I do know that uh, having experienced the, the juvenile system and the adult system is that there are a lot of survivors of violence on the inside and um, everybody, you know, it, it, Violence is this thing, like this, this, this ball of like energy that's created, right? And it's, and it, and it impacts a lot of people because you think about violence happens, and then now I, I tell my story, and now somebody else takes it in a little bit, you know, and then it just it, it has this ripple effect. And so, what do we do with this energy that's created when when violence happens? And so. Um, I would just say that, yeah, I had a, a lot of people that just kind of loved me through this. And um, I can remember a time where, you know, I took a giant step back and, you know, um, in, in my growth and development. And I remember Norma Hotelling, who was the executive director of SAGE at the time, I remember her coming out to an alley. She came out to an alley and she said, how are you doing? And I was like, no, I was like, I'm like, don't, don't look at me, you know, kind of, it was, but she was like, no, like, like I'm here, like I'm here and you like, and just having those consistent people to like love me through a lot of it, you know, like there's the, the little cycle of violence, right. That they show us where it's like the honeymoon and then the explosion and, you know, the tension and the explosion. And they say often like people go through that nine times. Some people, some people go through that nine times before they get and understand that or whatever it is, you know? And, um, so it takes time for us because we've been deceived, you know, like when violence happens, it's like something was, something is kind of broken inside of our spirits and we're like, whoa, I was deceived. And now it takes time to like be able to um, come to, you know, coming from just a survivor centered, you know, ex experience and um, kind of being able to define like what more power and agency and being able to like make those decisions on my own and people kind of supporting me through the way is I think that are really healing. And then there's times where, you know, um, where people don't make it around that, that little wheel of nine times. And so I've definitely, you know, um, have, have buried people. And, um, I think that one of the most, uh, the biggest things for me is uh, so is housing, and um, that is a very vulnerable time to like have that plan to like get to a safe environment. And we're living in one of the most expensive places in the world, and like it's it's intense. Like when I was eighteen years old, I was able to get an apartment at seven hundred dollars a month. That is not like that is non-existent for San Francisco right now. So I think that um, uh, one person in, uh, specifically, she was leaving out a domestic violent relationship, and um, she had a child that tied tied her to the relationship. And I remember calling every single shelter and everyone saying that we are full. We are full. We we're full. And it was, and you know, we, we, we found a place for, for her to safely to be at. And um, much like uh, Sonia had said, like her aggressor had lured her out. 
um, she was going to school and um, he said, I can give you a ride. I can give you a ride to school because we couldn't provide it. Who, who could provide her with a, a, a ride and, you know, like all this stuff. And, you know, this, this is a very real situation. And, um, and so he lured her out and he said that I have, I have a laptop for you. I have a laptop for you. And you know what? I'm open to co-parenting with you. And, um, and he had it planned that he was going to um, kill her that day. And, um, and that was the outcome. And I think that, you know, as, you know, the, the investment also too for the, the folks that are holding this work as well, you know, like we, we hold a lot inside of this work. And I think that um, I, I'm so glad that I had um, a really strong organization of that but built collective relationships of, amongst all the, the women. And um, I'm also part of an indigenous community and, um, a lot of the organizations came together to be able to um, to help us all from healing from from the violence of um, this person's that that had um, died, and so um, those are just two examples of of, of violence and how um, it can happen. Two really powerful examples. Thank you so much for sharing them, sharing your own story and letting us kind of have a moment to join in with you and some of the things you've experienced even through people you've known. Um, Kathy, I would love to hear um, a little bit about uh, whatever stories or um, experiences you feel help share the story um, and share the perspective. So um, both of those are, um, uh, Sonia and Julia, their, their accounts are so powerful and really meaningful. Um, uh, Sonia, I'll say I, when I was very young, I worked at a bank and I'm of an age where when I worked at a bank, women couldn't get credit without their husband co-signing. And I remember feeling so indignant. Uh, Julia, I love that look because that's exactly how I felt. It was like, what the heck that you have to have, uh, you know, your, your, um, you know, partner or husband or somebody else signed to, um, in order for you to have credit. And so the financial abuse thing has been a really big thing for me over the course of my life because I've worked in nonprofit and in banking over the years. And I've seen many cases of really devastation, um, you know, bank accounts emptied and things like that. So I just want to really talk about that. And um, also Norma was just like one of my, um, heroes. I just, I can remember the last time I saw her and where she was exactly where she was sitting. And it's just like, it, it's like tattooed on me. So I, I would say that I think a lot of people think about the work that La Casa does. And so we're often at the point of where there has been um, a violent incident has occurred and people are seeking safe shelter. And so that in some ways changes, um, that my my view of things, the dynamic, and it, very early on, I went to the police department, um, probably in the early 2000s, and sat down and read 150 uh, domestic violence police reports. And at the end of reading those, I I I have to tell you, I was just um, really uh, moved, shocked, whatever you would want to call it. I was stunned at the level of physical violence and also stunned that many of the um, survivors and victims weren't connected to any service provider, any helping organization. Um, their sole contact was somebody um, in law enforcement who was trying to investigate their crime at the same time as trying to handle their basic human needs, food, clothing, shelter. And they may, um, and many, in many cases, children were in tow and the officers were, um, you know, buying them dinners. And so I really saw this, um, this need to um, bolster that support so that law enforcement can do its thing on these domestic violence cases, 
and that the service community can help restore some level of freedom, agency, um, peace, tranquility, whatever it might be. And Julia really talking about, you know, not being the new rule setter, but being the person who has open arms and says, what can I do? I, I um, because just because of the time we're in, I happen to be here at times where I'm answering the phone because I'm the only person in the building. And when somebody calls, I say, please don't hang up. I'm going to connect you with somebody who's going to help you. But I'm really moved to make sure that I get that person connected. The other thing is recently, so I mean, that's, I think that that's what people think of when they think of La Casa, even though we have many different experiences of people over the span of their lifetime from uh, school age, um, adolescence, to um, victims uh, and survivors that they call not elderly, but later in life, 50 to 65, who are immensely vulnerable um, because they're, they're you know, not eligible for social security and they may be stuck completely in a financial bind where they're having to put up with abuses that, uh, you know, nobody should have to tolerate. But recently I've, um, you know, uh, La Casa had this really awesome opportunity to work with 35 women who are incarcerated in Chowchilla and provide them, conduct the 40 hour domestic violence counselor training and so we certified them all as um, domestic violence counselors. And in the process, the, the three staff people from La Casa who went and uh, did this over the course of two weekends, 40 hours over two Saturdays and Sundays. Um, so they were long days, grueling, really intense. But I think what I saw from my, from my perspective was a whole different view of of what domestic violence will, looks like, what happens um, if, you're, if you don't have the right support, if you don't have people advocating for you. And it really, I think in many ways, I'll say um, the three employees would say to me that it was life-changing for them and also really um, changed, uh, deeply changed the perspective of us here at La Casa and um, we, in recent weeks, I've, you know, met and um, been involved with two people who, you know, spent, you know, more than 30 years each behind bars and who are now free. And, you know, I, I think I have been forever changed by those moments. And what, the, what their experience was of violence is um, really no different then, then um, you know the victims that come through the door here at La Casa seeking a safe, uh, seeking safe shelter, and so it, it has been a, a a real awakening time, in many ways for me, and I'm I am, uh, you know, happy to have experienced that. But I I you know I'll just circle back to that I do think that um, you know we have uh, you know our uh, our reputation our 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 service provision is very much focused on being, um, you know, at the front end of a, of a uh, incident that will ins that will help somebody who may have gone through those nine times through the cycle of violence to figure out that it's time to get out because it's no longer, you know, it's not it's it's not going to change and it's only going to become more dangerous. So that's a little bit of experiences. Kathy, thank you for that and for each of you sharing. Um, uh, as Autumn said, it's so important to really try to understand the reality uh, here and that, you know, people I found really want to serve right now in this time um, and kind of understanding how to be of service when it looks so different for all of us um, during COVID. So I, I want to um, just double back on what you said, Kathy, and I know it's about six o'clock. We want to make sure that we are um, incorporating um, questions from our um, viewers. We want to thank people for joining tonight. So um, I, do, I know we have a couple things we want to highlight. Uh, so trying to do a couple of these questions, if, if folks could just spend maybe a couple minutes on, um, and Kathy, we'll start with you just following up on what you said about um, 
this time that we're in, the scary, surreal, defining moment that we're in in our lives um, around shelter in place, around the changes that we're seeing, around, you know, this certainly is not going to go back to uh, what it was before. Um, mm-hmm. And so how is that uniquely impacting um, survivors of violence um, who are in their homes? Um, like what are you seeing right now and how too can people be of service, people in the community be of service? Mm-hmm. So I, um, so it's interesting. At the beginning, our hotline cl- calls were um, kind of flat. And they really mirrored the uh, calls that were going to 911, which were also flat compared to last year. And then what we've seen as the longer time goes by is that we're the the calls we're getting are much longer, require a lot more logistical planning, a lot more safety planning. People are calling when they have a minute to call if they're lucky enough to be able to call. We also have a text line. And so people are texting with a lot more frequency than, than um, previously. And um, the, also, again, the length of the exchange around texting is um, longer because it's just more complicated and people are rightly fearful. And I think that I have described it a, a couple of times as being kind of the perfect storm. Um, um, you, you know, the kind of violence that we're talking about is about power and control. And so what you know, one of the hallmarks is to isolate um, the person from their support system, from their friends, their families, um, organizations that they go to, to learn, to grow, and to be connected with other individuals who are in their, their circumstance, whatever it might be, school, religion. Um, I, I mean, there's a whole host of things. So suddenly you are completely um, trapped in place And that has got to be so frightening. And I try and imagine it. And I I really, I'm, you know, all I can do is imagine it. I can't really know how horrible it must be. And I have to think that um, I say, you know, we're we're called survivors for a reason. Because I believe that, that there's the fortitude to survive this. And then when it's over, they're going to get out right? And so I think that um, there's going to be a very high demand for services when we get to the other side of this. Um, And we're already seeing it because as things are loosening up a little bit, there's a lot more calls. In the beginning, people were really reluctant to go out and seek um, helping um, services. People were afraid to come to shelter. And now we're, we're doing intakes on a pretty regular basis. Um, which I, I think is encouraging. It's scary, but at the same time, encouraging. So I do think that um, I, I do think that we're going to see a big uptick and uh, in demands for legal services. People are going to need to be financially stable in order to be able to get out. We're going to need all of these services that we're talking about in order to move forward. And I think that people you know, many people are connected to organizations and I think they really should in, you know, invest both of themselves, their time, their resources in organizations that they believe in and that they have, they feel like they have something to offer. And I, I would say the best place to start is to listen. And when, you, when you're when you asking if I were calling Young Women's Freedom Center, I would ask, what can I do? Can you tell me what do you need? Not me telling you what I think I might be able to do for you, right? To really listen to what you need and what and how I might be able to contribute. And I think that um, that can be really powerful. The listening can be really powerful. Thank you. Uh, agree that oftentimes that's where it starts. It's just listening to someone and what they need and, and understanding the the warning signs. Um, And I'd like to go, Sonia, to you next around uh, what are you seeing right now during this time of COVID? Certainly it's a scary time economically um, with a lot of people, you know, potentially losing work, um, layoffs that are happening. When we talk about the financial uh, freedom of women uh, and others who are trapped in these relationships, what are you seeing and what are some pieces of advice you give? Yeah, sure, thank you. 
So a couple of weeks ago, may have even been six weeks ago now, but it's all, all the time has merged. Um, we started raising money for a cash safety fund uh, for survivors. And our hope was to raise about $75,000 and to give out the cash to survivors, uh, like roughly around $250 a person. Um, we were able to raise, so far we've raised $101,000 and we've dispersed it all. Um, and when we had people start to apply for that money, we had over uh, 750, 750 applications um, in the span of two days. And we ended up having to close the application because we weren't sure if we were going to be able to support more people. And we asked folks a couple of questions in that application, which were voluntary if you had time and you, you wanted to answer. And so we learned a couple of things from that. We learned that uh, the average amount of money that survivors are saying that they need right now in order to be safe is $832, which when you think about it, it's not a lot of money to ensure somebody's safety. It's not a lot of money at all. Um, the top uh, financial concerns that survivors have right now are food and um, utilities bills. Um, and then we learned a lot of stories around what, how COVID has exacerbated either financial abuse or their financially precarious situation. And, you know, it's like what, uh, what Kathy said, survivors are survivors. We have this kind of misconception in our head that somebody is abused and then they run out the door and they take their keys and they go to a shelter and then that's how it goes. It's much more, there's a lot more planning that goes into it on the part of the survivor. Um, and so, you know, examples like survivors saying, well, I don't have access to my own cash, but what I would used to do is um, when my harm doer would go to work, I would bake and then I'd go out and sell what I baked pocket that money and then before my harm doer came home they, they had no idea it was happening and I was using that money that I was pocketing on a daily basis that was going to be the money that I was going to leave with and my hope was that I was going to leave at the end of this year and so probably I'm not leaving this year um, and it's it's I think what's really really important while while people are listening and they're paying attention to domestic violence is to really understand um, how it goes, how somebody leaves and the trajectory of that so that you can actually um, be supportive in a way that survivors uh, need. And so, you know, don't judge how much domestic violence is impacting people just based on police calls, for example, because that's not always the best determinant. Um, and I, I say this a lot, you know, survivors were trapped before COVID. It's like uh, this, the shelter in place and uh, shelter at home orders have given us all a slightly like surface experience of what it's like to be trapped at home, whether that's because you're immunocompromised or you um, have chronic pain or um, you're experiencing domestic violence. We, you know, we talk about how we're talking a lot about how isolation is so difficult for our emotional well-being while we're still putting uh, people who are incarcerated in uh, isolation. And so, you know, we're all kind of understanding a lot more about the world than I think any of us did before this. Uh, we've all learned through this. And how can we use this as a window to do something about that? so that when we all go back to our regular lives and we're all vaccinated and we can go on vacation and see our friends, survivors aren't still trapped. And we're, we're not still putting people who are incarcerated in uh, isolation for 45 days and so on and so forth. Yes, yeah, Sonia, I'd like to thank you for that. And, you know, I've been talking with uh, some of my friends, um, you know, if you look at just the cut of government services and the budgets that we're going through when people talk about ways that we can serve, you know, the numbers that you gave, $800 for a woman to feel safe. So again, it's, 
it's such an opportunity right now to to provide such a service to the community so the invitation for people to um, to do that uh, in, in the ways that will be most meaningful uh, to people who need the help and Julia I would like to go to you next um, for your thoughts as well before we go into audience questions um, both of the fact of um, our jails and our prisons are clearly very dangerous places, some of the COVID hotspots. Um, so how we're advocating for survivors who were inside. Um, and then for people who are coming out right now, um, you know, with the expensive housing, with the cutback in services, um, people that are coming out um, and potentially, you know, having very limited places to go. What are some things that you're seeing and what are some ways that the community can be supportive? Oh, Julia, I think you're on mute. Oh, really? Really? That too. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Teamwork. Okay. So right away, two, two things came to my mind when you said that, like locally, um, right when uh, COVID had happened, um, inside of our jail system here, they automatically, um, in order to social distance the, the men, they, they further, they, they shrunk everyone into one pod of all the women. And right away there was, you know, they disrupted what was kind of like they're, they're living and they confined them even further. So like that was dangerous, right? from the, the beginning. So I just think the, the conditions of not being able to social distance, um, it doesn't have, um, there's no ventilation inside of the place. They, they actually pay a fine every year for, because it it's, doesn't have um, an outdoor living or space to go in. So there's folks inside of there that haven't seen or, or felt air, fresh air, or, or felt sunlight on their face for, for years awaiting sentencing or, or what, whatever it is. So I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about like instances like that. And then I'm also thinking about um, the housing that we, we currently have right now, the emergency housing during COVID, uh, where we are prioritizing um, uh, long time uh, folks that are, or lifers or um, people that served out long term sentences coming home after 17, 25, 30 years of their lives and now coming back into this new environment that during COVID 19 presents a lot of challenges on their its, its own. So, like, uh, when they're being released with like no actual like services or, or plans. And so we've stepped in to, to be able to, I feel like it's a, like, it's like a, a warm blanket around, like, we got you, we got you. And it's like just bringing them in and um, being able to kind of get them like acclimated into, into the, the swing of things. And, um, and, and it's like everyone's coming into we we are practicing you know sheltering in place so that's that's different for folks that haven't been able to experience um that the outside and now being you know confined into another environment and so um on the inside you know people are super resilient and and they um have loved ones that they leave behind on the inside as well. And so um, now being in a new environment where, you know, you, you don't have access to those, those people that you may have just seen for the past 20 years of your life. And then now you're, and now you have this new, this new freedom. And it's almost like you, you leave your loved ones behind too. So I feel like there's that real, um, the, the balance of folks figuring it out for themselves and also feeling like they want to do more to be able to um, to make create that pathway for other folks to come home to and have an opportunity. And um, I think that with that being said is um, actually folks being able to 
um, get things like, you know, like little things are really difficult at this point, even for somebody leaving out of a, and it's also this, this housing is centers domestic violence survivors also as well. But one thing that's difficult right now is, you know, the, the employment, the, the, the economic opportunities of being able to go out and do, do your job search, do, um, get your documentation of, of an ID, a social security card, a birth certificate, all of those things are like presents its challenges now. So like we're moving differently right now. We're just moving a lot differently. And it's, um, it's there's a process to everything. So I think, and also um, they're not exactly like, oh, everybody's not opening their doors to do like viewings to, you know, if, if you are looking for housing at this point or to, to get into a different place of living, you know, folks aren't opening their doors as freely to like view apartments. And um, it's definitely presented its challenges. Because uh, what do you do for folks that when there's a shelter in place order and you don't have a home to shelter in place to, you know, and um, and you are somebody that has experienced violence and um, and you live in a tent, you know, in, inside of San Francisco, like there there is a very vulnerable population of folks that are living in, in vehicles and in tents as well. So, and um, they're, they're part of this city too. And I think that it, um, none of us can even do our run, our run for our central items and not know that that is actually something that, you know, uh, as a city that we're looking at too. So um, I think that uh, just uh, a couple of those things just come to mind uh, because I don't feel like we are just one thing, you know, in our lives, like one isolated incident. Like if I'm a survivor of domestic violence, like, uh, I am, there are many other things that, um, as a piece of part of people's stories. So, um, but that is one thing that we are doing right now is we actually have those, those beds and that emergency housing, and we hope to expand on that. And I think that this is something that we've always like, dreamed, dreamed of at, as an organization. And there's so many, Folks that are like, yeah, we got the internship, we got everything, but housing, like housing is that that one piece that, you know, as you you need these spaces to much like somebody goes away to college, right? And they live in a dorm and they have time to think and explore and like grow what they want for the future. Like people need those kind of opportunities too, and that that investment in them to be able to to grow and think about their their next steps and um what they're going to do. So um, I would definitely just say that um, investing in that, that piece of this, this organization is a huge opportunity. And I think that um, there's been phenomenal uh, folks that have come through this organization, not just one of, one of many, many people. And I just, um, yeah, I, I'm really honored to be um, in this position to be working in this organization. I can't wait for the next generation of leaders to come through here. So I, I would just say that that is the, the call to action to what, what, what moves your heart to, to and what you can do. Thanks everybody. Thank much for that. That's um, incredible. It's important for people to know how they can kind of get involved. And with that, I would love to move us to the Q&A section, which is, um, We've got a set of different questions here that are fantastic. I'm going to actually combine a few of these um, because I think that they have some connections. So one is uh, related to an issue of kind of resources and tools. Many of you, you've already shared a bunch of tools and a bunch of resources. However, I would like to put out there an opportunity to say if there's one, I'm just gonna ask you for like one specific resource or one specific tool that you haven't mentioned yet that you think people should be aware of. And if you don't have one, it's fine. You don't each have to answer. But if you have something that feels like it's timely, go ahead and share it with us, please. I can go. Um, 
so we recently put out a COVID uh, response guide, which um, is actually for everyone. It has what you can do as a community member, what you can do as a religious organization, what you can do as an employer, um, and kind of in line with building that ecosystem, there's something everyone can do. And, you know, Julia really shared how for her, it was community that helped her heal. And we've lost that a little as a movement and really kind of thinking about how does everybody do their part. Um, and then the next thing I'll just say really, really quickly, one of the things that Free From does is we have an online social enterprise. We uh, sell products made by survivors of domestic violence um, and the store operates to build income for survivors. Uh, and we have hand sanitizer and we have adult face masks and kids face masks. So if you uh, are in need, uh, we can help you out. Just visit our website. Okay. Kathy or Juliet, do you have anything? Fine if you don't. But... Uh, you know, I would just re reinforce that a starting point um, here is the hotline, which is 877-503-1850. Because in that moment, there'll be 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Someone will answer, and the person is someone who is at La Casa, either in this office or at the shelter. And so if you go to shelter, the very person you talk to on the phone is gonna be the person who greets you at the door. So really um, a compassionate um, contact and from there, all other items, can, you know, all other hope and resources can be um, dispensed. I'll just say. Great. Go ahead, Julia. I think too that uh, um, like when you're when you're getting out, like there's this this piece of you that there's like all these like resources and stuff that you can tap into. But um, I think that really is like when folks have the driver determination to to also be of support. It's it's kind of kind of funny because it's it's interesting how it works where somebody that has so little will give their last. I, I don't know if you ever experienced that. I experienced that though of like really struggling with people and like sharing the very last bit. And I just feel like I, I see that still to this day when I'm working with folks where they will split their last. And, and I still want, like, I still want to take that. Um, I want to, to, I want to take that love and desire and compassion to, to help others to also let you know that we have like a sister warriors freedom coalition like that if you do know like folks that are getting out that want to stay connected that you know have a story to tell or whatever it is or are interested in policy work or you know just the, uh, the first step you know in coming out we have a freedom 2030 campaign that um, folks can get involved in and uh, really hone in on their skills and and be part of that. Um, so yeah, I just think about centering self determination and what folks are asking for. You know, like that's that's what I just. If anybody can get anything out of what I'm saying is yeah, self determination. Just to hear and listen to to what people are asking and whatever it is, you know, just um, yeah. Debbie, I was going to pass it to you um, if you wanted to ask the next question as you see fit. Thank you very much. Um, we're getting a lot of questions, um, in particular, Sonia, for you of how um, other partner organizations, other community-based organizations can partner with you. I think it'd be great just to go around quickly and to hear that from each of the panelists uh, for other um, survivor-led organizations out there for other community partners. How can they potentially partner with each of your organizations? Sonia, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I would just say email me, sonia.passi at freefrom.org. Um, would love to chat about the different ways. The, the main way that we tend to partner with domestic violence organizations is by providing training to staff and support the staff. Um, but, and also if there are community groups, we can connect on, you know, launching peer-to-peer -peer 
financial support groups for survivors um, and uh, working on policy work together if that's what you do. So uh, I would just say email me and we'd love to start the conversation. Thank you, Julia. Ways that organizations can partner with you. Um, so, uh, definitely reaching out to our executive director for those um, partnering relationships. If you're like, you know what, like, I feel like we're fitting into the, the the piece of the puzzle right here, and I think that the community is definitely something that um, it will take all of our collective knowledge and all of our, you know. Brilliant. If you, th I think that it's there's many ways that people can get involved, but definitely Jessica Nowland. So, as somebody you can um, reach out to, or Sarah as our development director too. So it's either Sarah or Jessica at YoungWomenFree.org, and you can check out our website YoungWomenFree.org. I know we're already partnering with La Casa. Like it's not possible to do this alone like in isolation like we have to be moving collectively together so um in many different ways we have so many i only talked about like very small pieces of like of what we do we have so many different um things that we're doing right now so that would be the way to partner with us thank you yes i agree we all need each other and we all find each other um uh, but we need each other in particular right now Kathy, for you, yeah, uh, so variety of things to do. How can people partner? So um, we like to partner. We have lots of partnerships, as you could tell from my earlier presentation. Um, and we did just um, sign a formal MOU with Young Women's Freedom Center, and I'm amazingly, awesomely waiting to get started on on uh, making that happen. And one of the things that I learned tonight is that housing is really important. And so we have recently been funded um, by the state of California with a grant called Housing First for Domestic Violence Victims. And so we can help get um, victims and survivors into um, housing and subsidize um, help with, you know, um, you know, first and last month's rent, utilities, all kinds of things that help keep somebody stably housed or move into a new place. And we've even had during the middle of COVID, somebody successfully get housed, housed and moved to their new, new place, which we thought was so, um, so fantastic. But I mean, I see that as one of the ways. So tonight, I'm um, for sure, Julia, Julia and I will figure out a way to make sure that um, we, we make sure that both of our staffs know, know both of the employees know um, what we can do for each other's clients. For sure, so that's just one way. Like, like was previously said, I think there's so many there's so many ways that we um, can offer support. Where one program may have a strength, another pr program may need that may need that, and so we want to be open to working together. Thank you so much, all of you, for that. Uh, we are coming close to our close. Uh, so, one, I wanted to make sure to thank. Uh, Blue Shield of California Foundation and the Women's Foundation for helping to make this conversation possible. We are very much appreciative of their support. Uh, and also, I wanted to extend, uh, if it's okay with you, Debbie, I was thinking that we would have each of them just say kind of a final word, if you will. And of course, it doesn't have to be one word, but like a, a, a phrase, if you will, or that something that you think is meaningful for people to um, take with them as they leave this conversation. And why don't you begin, with, uh, Kathy, if that's okay with you? Um, okay, so I would say um, my, my closing um, words would be to be open, um, be really open to receiving um, requests for help or just to be um, standing with somebody um, in what, and responding to whatever their needs are in the moment. Just be really open and kind and receptive. Leah, do you want to share your final word, please? Yeah, um, 
I would say that um, there's a many, there's a lot of things I want to close with, but I would say to being survivors, uh, survivor centered in our in our approaches and um, also making space for for their opportunities to be survivor led too. I think that that's an important piece of this that we continue to um, for for folks that that that's something in their path or what they they want to do. It's in, in, it's important that it, they they are actually the ones that are informing our work because if we're too far removed from the the problem or the the issues then we will create something that may um, not be abused so you know the I mean or that people will not maybe utilize us as much so I think that just making sure that your your organizations or you know that you're making sure that there's space for folks to come through. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm going to ask Asanya to share her word, and then after that, Debbie, if you will just close us out all together. Thank you, Asanya. Sure. I'm sorry that I look like an angel right now. The light has significantly moved, and I'm not quite sure how to make this a little better. Um, I think what I would say is all of us know at least one person, most likely many more, who are survivors, who are in what we would consider to be abusive or toxic situations, in unsafe situations. And I really wanna encourage everyone to show up and be community. And I think that we, we put the burden on survivors to figure it out and we put the burden on survivors to get out and, and solve it for themselves. And you should call the hotline and you should you know find a safe place to go. And, it's a societal problem and we all have to own a piece of that burden and we all have to do our part. And it can be as simple as texting someone who you know is in a situation like this and saying, how are you? I'm thinking about you, you know? That's all you have to do. And I think in our heads, it's so much scarier. You know, you have to, what if they're not well ready to talk about it? But at the end of the day, it comes down to community. We all need it. It keeps us all alive. And that's no different for survivors of gender-based violence. I really want to thank each of you. And I think that's come through loud and clear. And I know having had the honor to work with many of you um, that, uh, you know, never underestimate just caring about someone and just taking the time to see them and to listen to them and it can change lives and we talked about that tonight too and so i just want to say i'm really nourished uh talking about community being here with all of you uh hearing all the work that you're doing uh seeing the things that have been on the chats people engaging with us tonight so really want to thank everybody thank people for caring about this something that's going to be uh, continue to be so important uh, as it has been um, as we know that this is a long journey economically and just the reality um, as we continue to work together to keep each other safe through this pandemic. So uh, it looks differently. Um, that's one thing we really explored tonight. Um, just a couple of, of things to highlight before we close. Um, number one, there uh, is a, uh, going to be a, a replay of this uh, uh, program tonight and that's on the newamerica.org events line. Um, uh, and I'm going to ask um, uh, one of our uh, very helpful folks from New America if they'll share that with everybody. Thank you um, to everyone so people can see um, where that's listed if you want to come back and see any resources. Thank you for everyone who's been sharing resources in the chat. Um, we'll also have a panel coming up on June 2nd and hope everyone will join us uh, then. This will be on women-owned businesses and in particular again the impact of COVID on women-owned businesses, how we can come together as a community to support uh, women-owned businesses and some of the resources that will be shared there. That's June 2nd uh, at 5 p.m. And so we hope that everyone will join us then. Uh, and again, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you for everyone who's tuned in today and thank you for caring about this very important topic. Thank you, good night.